On July 28, 2013, 50-year-old Robert Hoagie Hoagland got up early to get bagels, stopped at the gas station, and had breakfast with his son, Max, who was 23 at the time. He then paid some bills, played a little online Scrabble, and mowed the lawn. So you can't really have a more quintessential, like, dad Sunday <laughs> um, than that. But Hoagie was never seen after that day. And now, nearly seven and a half years later, the question remains, did this suburban Connecticut dad mow the lawn, gas up his wife's car, and just decide to start a new life? Or did his son Max and his drug use problems lead to a much darker fate for the family man? When a person gets missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Robert Hoagie Hoagland. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. So this one I want to get into, but it's a weird one, you know, and I come in to these usually having some sort of an opinion of as to what happened to the missing person because, you know, I've been researching it or mm -hmm. whatever. And this one, I'm really curious to get your perspective on because like, I don't know. I have no idea what happened to this guy. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Robert Hoagie Hoagland was born on June 9, 1963. Hoagie always dreamed of becoming a chef, and he actually met his wife Lori in culinary school. The pair married and eventually had three sons, Chris, Max, and Sam. Now, in the beginning, you know, the young family moved around a lot as the couple tried to find jobs in their chosen industry. Hoagie worked at many restaurants over the years in varying capacities, but it doesn't sound like his dreams of culinary greatness ever really materialized, you know, the way he was hoping. For her part, Lori passed her love of cooking down to the next generation as a culinary arts teacher at Newtown High School, and that was in their hometown of Newtown, Connecticut. The family settled in the Sandy Hook area of Newtown to have a quiet, friendly place to raise their family. And, you know, for many years, it was exactly that. But on December 14th, 2012, tragedy struck their idyllic town when a gunman walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School and murdered 26 people, including 20 children aged 6 to 7. Yeah, I was wondering if that was the same Sandy Hook. Yeah, the tragedy rocked the entire nation. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember exactly where I was when this happened. Yeah, same. Yeah, because our older boys, they were close in age to these kids. And I remember spending the entire day at work getting nothing done and just following the news coverage and then coming home and just sitting alone on the couch and just like crying and watching CNN. Yeah, I think I was uh, listening to the, the news in my car yeah. on the way home. And then when I made it to my apartment, I just sat in my car. Yeah. Like I couldn't get away from the news. Couldn't, I just, I just couldn't do anything. It was, no. It was terrible. It was, I mean, just really just a truly awful day in yeah. our country's history. So this happened just seven months before what we're talking about today in this episode. Um, so, you know, the wounds are still very fresh. And from what I understand, Sandy Hook is a small, tight-knit community. So there's a pretty good chance that the Hoaglands knew either family members of the victims or even some of the victims themselves. Um, you know, and I have to imagine that with such a personal connection to a horrible tragedy, they, they were grieving in some sense. But this wasn't the only thing the family had been dealing with. Their middle son, Max, had been using drugs and it had gotten out of control. Dealing with a loved one who has a drug use problem is an ongoing heartbreak. And the Hoagland family certainly was not immune to this. 
Hoagie and Lori loved their son, and they tried to do everything they could to help him. Max did complete a stint in rehab and ended up moving in with his grandmother, but it just all became kind of too much for her. Um, so in 2013, Max moved back in with his parents. So uh, Grandma is is in Sandy Hook or is... I think nearby. Nearby. Yeah. So that was probably his attempt at, you know, people, places, things. Mm-hmm. Okay. While Lori had a stable job as a teacher, Hokie still worked long restaurant hours. So when Max really started having problems, um, the family seemingly decided to just circle the wagons and really just focus on helping him out. Hoagie left the restaurant industry entirely and actually got licensed as a real estate appraiser and helped out at his friend's law office. And so this career change gave him the flexibility to spend more time with his family, including Max. But, you know, spending time with Max didn't just mean picking up bagels on the weekend. The same week Hoagie went missing, two laptops also went missing from their home. And, you know, yeah, it's... It's an it, indicator of, yeah, sell, yeah. selling property for, for drug money. Exactly. Right. I mean, you know, it's a safe community. It's not a place where, like, you randomly get laptops stolen out of your house. Um, so, of course, Hoagie figured that Max was somehow involved in this. Um, and he suspected that they were either stolen by the shady people his son was hanging out with or exactly what you said, that Max, you know, talked them, them for drug money. Yeah, exactly. Um, apparently, Hoagie knew where some of these people hung out. So he actually ended up going to an abandoned factory in nearby Bridgeport and confronted two men about these missing laptops. Mm. And, you know, they denied having anything to do with it. And we've talked in previous episodes about how any involvement with illegal drugs raises your chances of becoming a crime victim yeah, of absolutely. Some, in some regard, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think that can also be said of someone who maybe isn't doing drugs himself, but is confronting people in abandoned warehouses. Uh, yeah, I mean, anybody that has a connection in some way yeah. with, with someone that uses drugs, you know, there's, there is always a, a potential for crime. Exactly, happen, so. yeah. And so when Hoagie is reported missing just a few days after this, I think a lot of people thought that maybe he basically pissed off the wrong person and something happened to him. Hmm. And I think the drug angle is probably why this case got so much media attention in the beginning. You know, because as we know, police aren't typically inclined to really investigate missing persons cases when it's an adult because there's always that chance that the person just took off. Right. And, you know, as we've discussed many times, like, that's not illegal. Like, you yeah. can just leave your life. Yeah, it's a shitty thing to do, but right. you, you but, absolutely have the right to do that. Yeah, and it's not the police department's problem, yeah. you know? right. But in this case, like, yes, there was the drugs, but, you know, the fact that it was also such an ordinary day... In addition to the online scrabble and the lawn mowing, Hoagie was making plans. So his wife, Lori, had been on vacation with friends in Turkey for the past 17 days, and he was supposed to pick her up from the airport when she returned on Monday, July 29th. Despite the fact that the couple spoke on the phone on Saturday night and confirmed these plans, when Lori arrived at JFK Airport in New York City, there was no one there to greet her. Okay, so they spoke on Saturday. Yeah, they spoke on Saturday night. She was coming in on Monday. Okay, so Sunday... Sunday was bagel day. Okay. So Sunday was the day that he had bagels with Max. He mowed the lawn. He, like, gassed up her car because um, she was coming home. I'm try I'm just trying to get a, a timeline. Yeah. So Sunday, when was the last time anybody saw him? Um, so we're getting to that. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we're getting to that. It, but it was Sunday, right? So it was Sunday afternoon when he was last seen. So wife spoke to him on Saturday. He was seen on Sunday. But then by Monday, nobody knew where he was. Monday, when Lori's at JFK, 
you know, she obviously tries calling her husband to, because maybe he like got the times mixed up or, you know, sure. whatever. Um, but she never received an answer. So she eventually went to a family member's home in Brooklyn after waiting for like two hours at the airport mm. um, just to kind of, you know, get because Brooklyn. So for those of you who are not familiar, like JFK is in Queens. Um, and so like Brooklyn is a short cab ride. Um, so much easier than getting from JFK to Newtown, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, so she went to Brooklyn and while she was there at her family member's house, she, you know, obviously continued trying to reach out to Hoagie and figure out like what the hell is going on. Um, but while she was there, she received a disturbing phone call. Hoagie's boss's wife, and remember, like, his, so this is at the the law firm, and they were friends okay. with, it was like their friend's friend, law firm. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, because it's like, why is your boss's wife, like, calling? But, <laughs> you know, it's right. their buddies. Yeah. Um, so she calls to tell Lori that Hoagie didn't show up for work that day. Mm-hmm. And so she is presumably calling Laura because she obviously couldn't get in touch with him and is similarly wondering what's happening. Does he have a cell phone or is all of this landlines? No, no, cell phone. Okay. I mean, it was 2013. Well, yeah, I know, but you know how some 50-year-olds are. Like, <laughs> I don't no, know. he was like a normal one. He had a cell phone. <laughs> So at this point, you know, all right, so Lori is in Brooklyn, husband hasn't picked her up, didn't show up for work. So she's obviously thinking that there is something wrong beyond him flaking Mm -hmm. on the time that she arrived. But, like, she's not in full-blown panic mode yet. Okay. Um, You know, her flight didn't arrive until 4 p.m. on Monday, and she's probably exhausted uh, you know, coming from Turkey, that's like a long flight. So she ends up spending the night in Brooklyn okay. um, and then heads back home to Connecticut the next day, Tuesday, Tuesday, July 30th. But when she gets there, she finds no trace of either her husband or her son, Max. And on top of that, her car, a Volkswagen Golf, is gone. But Hoagie's car, which is a Mini Cooper, is sitting in the driveway. Hmm. Yeah, so she gets home on Tuesday, no husband, no son, no car, but husband's car is there. Hmm. And still can't get in touch with anyone. No sign of forced entry or anything? No, nothing like that. So she's obviously trying to figure out what's going on at this point. So, you know, she starts to look around the house, Mm -hmm. just like you said, to like see if there are any clues or or anything, really. Um, So she goes into her husband's office and finds his phone keys, passport, and blood pressure medication, all there. So in her eyes, this is what she's, you know, seeing right now, his wallet and his and her car were gone. So, you know, maybe he's somewhere short term, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, right. he doesn't have his blood pressure medication or his passport, but like, you know, there are plenty of places you can go without right. those two things. But You know, she couldn't find any clothes or anything else missing, so it doesn't look like he decided to, like... Spend the week somewhere else. Yeah, Yeah. right? So, yeah, so she's still kind of confused, but, like, yeah, just really can't get a handle on what's going on at this point. So while the whereabouts of her husband remained a mystery, Lori was at least able to quickly figure out where her son was. Bridgeport police contacted her and told her that Max had been arrested the night before. So he was. Monday night. mm -hmm, Yeah, he was arrested for trespassing near that old factory where his father confronted the men about the laptops. Um, Police were patrolling that area because it's known for drugs and sex work. And Max, you know, admitted that he was there to buy drugs. And but he said that he had permission to be driving the car he was in, his mother's Volkswagen Golf. Okay. So now so now we have the son and the car. Right. Okay. But still no hoagie. But when police contacted Lori, she was like, uh no, actually, he does not have permission to be driving that car. Um and you know, go to Bridgeport and buy drugs. Like that's not actually something I allowed him to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, she let him kind of twist in the wind a little bit and, um, they, they held him on a $2,500 bond. Mm. 
But, you know, again, I'm sure like Lori couldn't even worry about that at the moment because she's obviously coming to the conclusion that if Max had her car in Bridgeport, that Where's means, Hoagie then? Exactly. Yeah. Like he's not only gone, but he didn't have any of the vehicles. Yeah. Right. Or a cell phone. It's, yeah. It's just him and his wallet missing. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's a lot more concerning to her, obviously, than like he took her car somewhere. Right. So at this point, it seems clear that we have an actual missing person, but what's still not clear is whether or not he's missing of his own volition. The police get involved, though, and start digging into his last known whereabouts. So as I mentioned at the top of the episode, on the morning of the 28th, Hoagie went to a gas station to fill up his wife's car. While he was there, he also bought a map of the eastern United States. Now, I know you're looking at me. So going back to like some 50-year-olds not having a cell phone, like he did have a cell phone. But according to an episode of Disappeared about this case, Hoagie was a map guy. So even though it was 2013 and GPSs were commonplace, as were like Google Maps on your phone Mm -hmm. or whatever, he didn't use them and like still liked to use paper maps whenever he needed directions. Which have you? When's the last time you even saw one of those maps in a gas station? In I can, a, I, right? Like in a I gas can't station? even think yeah. about. I can't even think of it. Yeah, but I, I mean, it's been at least ten years since I've seen a map. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, twenty thirteen, the gas station by his house, like, still had them. So we don't know why he bought the map. Well, you said he likes to use maps for directions. Yeah, and it was of the eastern United States. They're in Connecticut, so they're in the eastern United yeah, States, right? right. Um, yeah, so, well, to the Hoaglands, this actually did represent a significant clue mm-hmm. because Hoagie had talked about taking Max away on a hike on the Appalachian Trail. Okay. Probably, you know, as a way to get him away from drugs and the people he's still hanging out with. And to possibly reconnect with a son that he, you know, felt was slipping away from him. Sure, yeah. So based on this, because of this map, you know, the Hoagland family connected with the National Park Service Rangers about their missing family member. And so they put up flyers with this photo near their trail. So they're thinking that he just spontaneously decided to go on a hike? Kind of, like maybe, yeah, basically, that, you know, he was talking about taking Max to the Appalachian Trail, and so maybe he just spontaneously decided, you know what, maybe I just need to get away myself, right? Because, all right, so if you think about it from Lori's perspective, she's been gone for 17 days. I'm sure she heard about the whole laptop thing while Mm -hmm. she was gone, right? Yeah. She gets home, her son's arrested for buying drugs, so maybe shit was just going bad when she was gone and maybe hoagie was like you know what i need a break can't deal with this i'm gonna go hike but is is their house anywhere close to a trail entrance because both of the cars were still at the house so he walked from his house to a trail somewhere yeah well exactly i I mean mean, i'm not saying you know they don't they didn't think they like cracked the case yeah yeah. I'm, i'm just i'm I know. It, it's it's just all they had, really, at yeah. that point to go on. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I, yeah, I get that. It's just it, it, that just doesn't add up to me no. uh, that he would walk to a trail unless the trail is close to the house. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. And they don't say anything about that. That's kind of what they were clinging to, though, right? Because, mm-hmm. like, that's at least... At least oh, it's something, yeah. Right. And it's a good resolution right. to the mystery if that's yeah, what it maybe is. Maybe he's lost on the trail somewhere. Yeah, or not lost, just on the trail somewhere, just like hanging out and getting away from his life for a little while. But was there evidence that uh, that he had like taken a pack, packed no. up some clothes, Nothing like that. camping supplies? Mm-hmm. Okay. Again, they're, they're clinging to hope. Exactly. I, I get it. But. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so in the early days, like... That's what Lori wanted to believe, that there was a good chance her husband just decided to take a little time away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, police continued to investigate all avenues. Because if Hoagie didn't leave on his own, it would stand to reason that his disappearance had some sort of connection to Max. 
When the police interviewed him, Max did admit to stealing the laptops to sell for drug money. Okay. Authorities were also able to track down the two men that Hoagie had confronted and interview them as well. But after speaking with them, police determined that the men had nothing to do with Hoagie's disappearance. Hmm. Presumably they alibied themselves somehow. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I couldn't, the police didn't. Yeah, they're not going to release that. Details yeah. about why. Um, but yeah, they said that like they don't think that those two men, regardless, you know, despite the fact that Hoagie had that interaction with them, um, you know, less than a week before he disappeared, they just, yeah, they don't think that they had anything to do with it. Mm. As for Max, he says that the last time he saw his father was on the morning of the 28th after breakfast. Hoagie was out mowing the lawn and Max came out to take the Golf, his mom's car. He told his dad that he'd be back in a few hours. This interaction was confirmed by a neighbor who saw the pair talking and then witnessed Max driving away in his mother's car while Hoagie was mowing the lawn. And this is in the morning on Sunday? It, it's like late morning, early afternoon okay. kind of time. Police gave Max a polygraph and the FBI even performed a statement analysis. And both indicated that Max had no knowledge of his father's whereabouts. And this was further bolstered by a forensic search of the Volkswagen that he had been driving, which turned up clean. And you can understand why they're looking so closely at Max, right? I mean, because, oh, absolutely, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not just his associates, like family members have been known. Oh, yeah. Y you know. Well, he's a, he, you know, Max is a drug user. We don't know what specific drug was his preference. Yeah. yeah, I mean, who knows? So th that's that's the first avenue to explore. Well, yeah, and it, yeah, it has to be, right? Yeah. Because, you know, he's involved in shady things. He's admitted to stealing. And it seems like he was the last person to see his father alive. Right, right. So, well, last person to see his father. Yeah, so, yeah. So... Yeah, so they have to look at him. But again, like, nothing turned up hmm. and if yeah if something did happen you would think that they would have turned up some sort of physical evidence in the car right um but no nothing and obviously there wasn't any indication of violence or anything in the house or sure. around the house and the neighbors saw him leave and hoagie was still there and you know so there's a lot of evidence pointing away from max having anything to do with this right so while her son was cleared in her husband's disappearance, which, you know, I'm sure she was obviously very happy about, Lori would soon make a discovery that made her heart sink. About 10 days after Hoagie was last seen, Lori found her husband's wallet and his car keys hidden underneath a doll in their bedroom. Interesting. Yeah. This means that when he left, he had nothing with him. No car, no wallet, no passport, no clothes, and no medication. Hmm. Yeah. Although he had withdrawn an unaccounted for $600 on July 25th, there was no evidence that he was using any credit cards or other funds since he was last seen on July 28th. So, you know, we do have a missing $600, an unaccounted for $600. But, I mean, that's not a lot of money to start a new life with. No, and um, e even if you are starting a new life, the blood pressure medication? Yeah. I feel like you'd probably take that. Yeah, yeah. I mean... You know, it's one thing to, to leave your wallet and car keys and mm -hmm. go walk about or whatever, but blood, pre blood pressure medication, like, you, that's outside of a new life. You still need that. Right, exactly. So I feel like if if this was something that he had planned, um, he still would have taken that. Mm -hmm. And But what's really disturbing, I think, is the fact that his wallet was hidden. Yeah. You know? Right. I mean, that to me really indicates that, like, 
I mean, one, obviously he didn't want the wallet to be found, but like, so does that mean that they, that he didn't want people to know that he didn't have anything with him? Like, why do you hide the wallet like that? I don't know. But yeah, and he, I mean, it, again, it was like under this like weird doll in their room that I guess is just like some decorative thing that they never did anything with because she didn't find it for 10 days. And obviously, you know, yeah. I would assume that she'd been kind of like tearing the place apart a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. So like, that's not something that just accidentally gets left there. Like it gets right. put there for a reason. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, 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 yeah. That's that was my thought was, is this someplace where. They never touch. They yeah. never go over to. No. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like if she did, if she didn't find it for ten days, and and yeah, it's I guess it's a, a, an area or a piece of furniture or something that yeah. they just don't use. So it wouldn't make sense for his wallet and keys to be there. Right. I don't understand why anybody would hide. What what would be the point of hiding those? Yeah, I don't know. Whether I it's mean, just him or somebody else or somebody else. Right. I mean, maybe unless so, there was some sort of evidence there that they didn't want to be found maybe no uh, no maybe i mean fingerprints on the wallet from taking the 600 dollars. yeah no it doesn't say it doesn't sound like anything mm -hmm. you know about the wallet itself was suspicious just the fact that it was there yeah. you know the only thing i can think of is is really you know wanting to maintain the idea that he had gone somewhere and was going to be back right or like gone somewhere short term you know but if you don't have the wallet it's more alarming so maybe it was just like to either one hide what had happened to him or give him a head start by not alarming people that much or maybe max took the 600 dollars out of the wallet to use for drug money and then hid the wallet yeah so that it gave him a little bit of time before his dad found out that yeah. the money was gone Oh yeah, maybe. So you're so you're thinking that Max that this is like not necessarily even connected to the disappearance. No. That maybe Max hit the wallet, so that Hoagie was thinking he just lost his wallet, right? To give him enough time to go out and oh, that's score interesting. Drugs. I that yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That this could just be completely unrelated to the disappearance, and yeah. could just be related to you know all the previous drama. Yeah. Hmm. Just a theory. Yeah, I don't know. Well, so police continued to investigate, but at this point, they didn't really know what they were investigating. You know, was it an abduction, a suicide, a guy who just left? Like, they didn't know. So they turned to his computers in search of answers. When they searched Hoagie's work computer, you know, they didn't find much out of the ordinary. But they did find that he had searched for an address in Rhode Island multiple times. That's like kind of weird, but he was a real estate appraiser, but it's a different state. Right. Like, you know yeah, what I mean? Is he licensed to do that in Rhode Island? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's somewhat, in, like not the weirdest thing in the world, because, um, you know, I, I'm a realtor and I have like strange you know, addresses and stuff that I look up <laughs> that have nothing to do with my actual business all the time, right? Anything I should be worried about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, so police look into this address, but, like, they couldn't find any connection between it and Hoagie. So not through work or anything? No, it, I mean, it could have just been, like, a house he thought was interesting, you know? It could have just been something completely benign. Mm-hmm. So authorities then tried to do a similar search on his home computer, obviously, because I would assume they'd think they'd find more interesting information. Sure, maybe, maybe some, some maybe leads to... Yeah, like where he was going, what he was planning. what that house, if there's a connection to that house that he was looking up or anything. Yeah, yeah. anything. But about a month before his disappearance, Hoagie or someone had installed a program that deleted all searches and results. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So at this point in the story, I want to pause and see like where you think we are. You know, personally, like we said, I'm always a little wary of the, he took nothing with him and abandoned his life narrative. Yeah. But at the same time, like as soon as there's a whiff of drugs, people also seem to jump right into a Scorsese movie. <laughs> 
So, like, so, like, all right, what are your thoughts at this point? I don't know, honestly. Right? Yeah. It's so weird. Did Max have a computer? Well, no. I mean, there were those two laptops that he stole, but I don't know, like, if one of them, like, I don't know. If one of them was his or I mean, I guess he wouldn't have stolen it if it it was. So I don't think he had it. I think it was all kind of his parents. I'm just curious as to who would install a program like that on the on a computer if if max is even halfway with it mm-hmm. he could figure out how to delete browser histories and right. clear your cache without downloading a program that seems like something that an older person who doesn't know how to do that or isn't very computer savvy may do yeah and so it's interesting because if you look at it in terms of the disappearance, you could think, like, he's planning something. Hoagie is, right? Yeah. Like, he's planning on walking away. He's planning on starting a new life. And, and he, he doesn't, doesn't want to be found. Right. He doesn't, so he doesn't want to leave want clues. Right. So you can look at it from that perspective. Or you can look at it like he's a 50-year-old dude who doesn't want his wife seeing what kind of porn he's looking at. Oh, yeah. Well, I, w- I wasn't thinking that. But, yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. I mean, it could be something completely unrelated, you know? Yeah. And relatively innocent. Yeah. Yeah. So that's tough for me because it's like, you know, in that episode of Disappeared, it's treated as this, like, crazy, suspicious, like, thing. But, I mean, yeah, it could just be porn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it, and th- I'm assuming they don't say specifically what the program is because it, it could be, like, an antivirus program i know a lot of those do that too yeah i don't know so yeah they don't get into it just that like basically it was frustrating for police because they couldn't get any clues yeah because there's just really nothing to look for as hard as it is for me to buy that someone would leave all of their money and start a new life without so much as their blood pressure medication that's really that's what keeps hanging me up on it that he didn't leave yeah because you know that's Blood pressure medication is, is can be life and death. Well, it can be, know? but think so, of it this way. It's blood pressure medication. It's not like oxy, right? So he maybe he just got more from his doctor. Like, I think they're pretty, you know, like, hey, I lost my medicine. I lost my bottle. Like, I did this. I need more, whatever. I don't think they're going to, like, ask too many questions or, or give you too much of a hard time. Yeah. So maybe he just didn't take that bottle, but maybe he still had some. Uh, uh, all right. You know? I, I have no idea. Like, yeah. there's no evidence that, that he did that whatsoever. I want to be clear. But I'm just saying, like, blood pressure medication, like, I don't think it's very hard to get. Sure. It just it, it just doesn't make sense. Like, why wouldn't you just take it with you? Right. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, like, Instead why of going through the nice? trouble of contacting your doctor or if you're starting a new life finding a new doctor right you know yeah like it to me even if you're leaving just you your blood pressure blood pressure medication like that's a pill that you take every day yeah you know but again like maybe he just if he really doesn't want to be found you know maybe he just doesn't want to give any indication to his family that he left on his own accord you know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And something that we need to mention is that this whole walking away from his life thing isn't exactly unprecedented behavior for Hoagie. Okay. 19 years earlier in 1994, the Hoagland set off on an adventure. According to that episode of Disappeared I mentioned earlier, the young family moved across the country to California with no money and no jobs, which, you know, is something I don't think I would do with kids, but no, definitely is not. something I absolutely would have done otherwise. And actually, I, it wasn't across the country, but I, you know, I definitely did do that. Yeah. I moved to New York City with a duffel bag and $250 um, and no job. But as you may imagine, once you add kind of kids into that and you're like completely across the country, um, things didn't exactly go smoothly. Oh, weird. Yeah. Apparently, it took a long time for Hoagie to find a restaurant job when they moved there, but he finally did. And things seemed to be going well 
And according to Lori, one morning, several weeks into his new position, he left home and told her not to wait up. Um, and this wasn't unusual at all because like the restaurant where he worked had events. And okay. so a lot of times, you know, he had to stay late and, and help with those. So, you know, he worked odd hours, like Lori didn't think anything of it, but Hoagie never came home after work. And Lori soon found out that her husband had been let go from his job two days earlier. Uh Oh, yeah. So what was he doing? Well, days turned into weeks with Lori and her small children sitting in their California home, wondering where Hoagie had gone. Mm. But three weeks later, he returned. According to Lori, he told her that he got scared and needed some time away. He felt ashamed that he had lost his job and couldn't face her knowing that he wasn't able to take care of her and their boys. The couple reconciled and soon gave up on their California dreams and moved back east. So did he say where he had been for those three weeks? I mean, I'm sure he did eventually. But what's interesting about this disappearance that we should talk about is that, you know, there are some similarities to what eventually happens in 2013. Namely, that the day he disappeared back in 94 was a seemingly normal day in which Hoagie was following his standard daily routine. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot more differences. Hoagie took the family car, for instance, back in 94. And when he was gone, he also used his credit cards. Mm -hmm. So he was easily tracked. And like, while the family, I'm sure, was worried because they didn't know where he was really, or if he was coming back, they at least knew that he didn't fall off the face of the earth and could reasonably assume that he was safe. Mm -hmm. So the next question to me then is, does this prove that he didn't leave on his own because he was so easily found last time and was only gone for three weeks? Or does this indicate that he did leave on his own and just did a better job of covering his tracks this time? I mean, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think it says anything one way or the other. I just think it's really interesting to me that somebody who just disappears one day had, had done, done it before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I guess you're right. There's similar circumstances on around both instances, you know, mm-hmm. stressed out yeah. situations. One, he's lost his job, has, you know, young kids mm-hmm. in the in the house. And the other, you know, his his, his son, son is, is going through all this drug stuff and he's like confronting guys in abandoned factories. Like yeah. yeah, two very stressful times. Yeah. So again, is this another coincidence or did he just learn from that? So you would think, okay, so he's got Six hundred dollars cash, let's say. Let's say, presumably, we don't know. Yeah, if he doesn't have a planned location of where he's going, mm-hmm. you need a credit card to book a hotel room. Yeah, typically. Unless you're staying in some really shady places. Yeah. But he didn't take his no. wallet, so there's no credit cards to track. No credit cards, and yeah, and there were there was no activity on his credit cards, the bank, like nothing. Unlike in 1994. Unless he opened a, a or got a, a new credit card that nobody knows about. Mm-hmm. But, but I would assume under, they would be they, checking his social security right, number, yeah, right? Was, yes, right. Yeah. yeah, that's where I was just going to go. Exactly. If, if it's a, if it's in his name, if it's under his social, like they would have found it at some point. Maybe it. not right away. Yeah. Maybe not in that first week or two. Right. But, but it, I mean, it shows up on a credit report, a well, simple yeah, credit report. Exactly. So yeah, those they, new credit inquiries, <laughs> and, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because no, my thought was that maybe that was what he was hiding. Um, with the search history on the, mm-hmm. on the, on his, uh, on his computer. On his computer. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, that would have shown up at some point if it was under his name, if it was under his social. Yeah. Some evidence that kind of leads to the latter possibility of him, like just getting better at walking away from his life in September of 2013, just about two months after he was last seen at his Connecticut home, Someone reported that they had seen Hoagie in Rhode Island. Mm. 
Now, this sighting was especially interesting to police because if you remember, they had found all of those searches for an address in Rhode Island. Yeah. A sighting of a man with a backpack who was walking around Rhode Island Route 117 and I-95. Police immediately investigated, of course, thinking that this very well could be him. Mm-hmm. Um, but that man was actually found and identified as somebody else. Mm. But another man was cited by the Rhode Island Department of Transportation. Um, And this man was similar looking and also had a backpack. And he was seen walking along Rhode Island routes 165 near Voluntown, which is close to the Connecticut state line. And authorities couldn't track this man down. So he's never been identified either way. And how close is that? Uh, to the address that he was searching. Do we know? Mm-mm. No, they never really get into that. Yeah. But Rhode Island's a very, small, a very state. small state. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so, relatively <laughs> close. <Sure. laughs> there was also another reported sighting of Hoagie back at a store in Connecticut. But that person was caught on surveillance footage, which aired on Disappeared. And other than being like a bald white guy, this person looks nothing like Hoagie. And mm. you know me, like I cannot tell white men apart to <laughs> save my life. Yeah. But even I was like, that is nowhere near that dude mm. uh, when I saw the footage. Since then, there have been rumors that Hoagie was working as a cook down in Hilton Head, South Carolina. But no solid evidence has either has ever come out to prove that. We have these sightings mm-hmm. in Rhode Island. One that we... Definitely know is not him. Right. One we definitely know is not him. The other one... Maybe. One that could be, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Walking with a backpack. Now, uh, he again, he left without transportation. Mm-hmm. Uh, presumably, he only has $600 cash. Amtrak runs pretty well through there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be an easy avenue for him to head up north. Yeah. Hilton Head, I think that would be harder for him to get to. I don't know. I mean, I think a bus could get you there, I mean, pretty easily. Uh, yeah, I guess. And, and so here, let's go back to the $600 thing, right? So there's $600 that were unaccounted for that he had withdrawn, like, right before he disappeared. Yeah. But let's say he was planning on leaving. I mean, again, six hundred dollars doesn't get you very far. In no, life. but who says that that's all he had? Yeah. Like, do I mean we obviously we don't count pennies, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, what if he was taking twenty dollars here, thirty dollars here, uh, so twenty dollars there that, for it months? Could have been that he could have just. He could have just been squirreling cash away. That's true. For a while. And yeah. if he's just, you know, taking small amounts here and there, like, nobody's going to notice that. I don't understand what the uh, what the point of hiding it that well would be. Like, if, you, if, you're, if you're starting a new, a new life and essentially going to disappear, why go through the trouble of doing all that? Why not just take a large sum of money out and just go? Yeah, I I mean, I don't know. Again, the only thing I can think of is to give himself more of a head start. You know, because, like, you got to think, everybody's kind of figuring out in the first couple weeks, you're like, okay, well, did something happen to him? Did it have something to do with Max? Mm -hmm. Was he a victim of violence? You know, is he on the Appalachian Trail? Like, they're going down all these different avenues as opposed to if he took, you know, several thousand dollars and left a note that said, all right, peace, I'm out. (laughs) Like, they would have started just looking for him in that regard immediately. Yeah, well, I guess guess for me, the the hang-up is that, you know, he had these 17 days where his wife wasn't in town that he Mm -hmm. could have left, and he waited until... Like, right before she came back? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And that is a good point because that could have given him an even bigger head start. Exactly. If that was what he was going for. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. And that's, like, why this is... I just have no idea on this one. And, you know, when I was researching this case, most of the information came from the first year after he disappeared. Um, At that time, Lori seemed to believe that her husband had been the victim of foul play. Mm -hmm. 
She told the Danbury News Times in 2014 that she believed that he could have upset someone enough to hurt him if he was trying to protect his children. Quote, I've seen him chase people down the street with baseball bats. End quote. <laughs> so, like, okay. I mean, you know, again, I'm going back to him confronting people at an abandoned factory. Like, this guy clearly, when it came to his kids, was willing was to protective. put himself in physical danger. Yeah. Hoagie's oldest son, Chris, also doesn't believe that his dad just took off, but for a much simpler reason, his shoes. Apparently, his dad loved wearing loafers, like just loafers 24-7, like that's all he wore, no matter what the weather, no matter what his activity, like he just wore loafers, and both pairs were still at the house after he disappeared. So what shoes was he wearing then? I don't know. We're assuming he has another pair of shoes, right? I mean, I'm assuming like he has a pair of tennis shoes or something. But yeah, yeah he like didn't take his loafers. And that's why Chris is like, he did not leave of his own volition. Because that man, he might leave his family, but he wouldn't leave his loafers. <laughs> well, I mean, there is something to be said about that. Right? But, you know, it's like your theory about the money. If he's planning this out for months ahead of time. Maybe he bought some new leave-in loafers. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I I don't know either, yeah. Yeah. But as the years have gone on and no sign of their beloved Hoagie has ever turned up, not even after that 2016 episode had disappeared, it seems as though the family may believe he did just decide to walk away. The Find Hoagie Facebook and Twitter accounts have gone dormant. And, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but there's a commenter I found on Reddit who claims to be close friends with Chris, the oldest Mm -hmm. son, he posted on the Unresolved Mysteries board about this case, quote, I grew up in Newtown and am quite good friends with his son, Chris, who was on the Disappeared episode. I talked to him after it aired, and he said that his family is almost sure it was voluntary. Very sad. He said he just hopes his dad is happier now, and all he wants is to see him again, end quote. If he did leave uh, on his own accord, so we we've we said this in the Daniel Ewan case. You know, if if you left on your own accord, uh, you know, like we said earlier, it's not illegal. Mm-hmm. But just make a phone call. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, his his kids were all grown adults, right? You know, he and his wife, um, I didn't really get into this, but they had had marital problems, you know, beyond that, like, 1994 mm-hmm. <laughs> incident where he left for three weeks. Like, and they had talked about splitting up. Um, but it's like, they're everybody's adults here. Like, right. if you want to leave, just leave. Yeah. But don't let people wonder for se- it's been over seven years at this point yeah that's exactly like again i don't if he left on his own accord why shroud it in mystery right why like, not just go yes i mean what's the point of the cruelty yeah of, of leaving them wondering yeah so i mean that's the question we're left with can a man buy bagels for his son and then disappear from his life Or did something far more tragic happen to Robert Hoagland? Either way, he has a family who just wants answers. Robert Hoagie Hoagland has been missing from Newtown, Connecticut since July 28, 2013. He was 50 years old at the time of his disappearance. He was 6 feet tall and 175 pounds. He was balding and had close cropped hair. He would be 57 years old today. If you have any information about what happened to Robert Hoagie Hoagland or where he might be, please contact the Newtown Police at 203 426-5841.
You can see all of the sources for this episode, along with photos and video on our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social. And then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'd like to hear from you. So you can actually leave us a message uh, at the link in our show notes. And we may play it on a future episode. But we will see you right here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!